welcome to my talk. Uh, this is the podcast series brought to you by ASS Market Intelligence. If you are just like us, passionate about financial services industry, about asset management, wealth management, insurance, banking, um, um, fintech, you have come to the right place. Um, we are coming to you every month with my talk um, about a topic uh, an industry topic um, uh, and uh, about the latest developments in the industry. And what we're trying to do is not just to stay at the headline level, but really dig a little bit deeper and peek under the hood of um, industry data, industry headlines, and, and deliver you, um, if you will, maybe the second day story and a little bit uh, more reflection about the developments in the business. If you enjoyed this episode of uh, my talk, episode of uh, my talk, um, Please subscribe to my talk um, podcast on your preferred um, uh, podcast platform. Uh, we are aiming for monthly or even more frequent episodes, and they will often feature uh, talks with thought leaders in the world of asset and wealth management and retail financial globally. My name is Goshka Folda. I'm uh, the global head of research at um, um, ISS Market Intelligence. And once again today, um, we have an exciting topic uh, to discuss and really great guests to explore it. Um, this time around, we're going to turn our attention um, at, um, uh, the global asset management business. We're going to land in London, um, uh, England today. And it is my pleasure to introduce my guests, uh, my colleagues at ISS Market Intelligence, Mark Hamper and Bed Ben Reed uh, Hurwitz. Both of them, uh, as I mentioned, uh, are joining us from London, joining uh, us from London, uh, um, our London office, where they work with the, um, the Global Inter Distribution Intelligence Unit at ISS Market Intelligence. Before I um, say welcome to them, um, I will mention that Mark Camper is head of client data strategy at uh, the MI um, Global Net. Mark has had a storied career in the European Fund Administration, management distribution business, um, spanning three decades and doubled in FinTech and uh, all sorts of uh, exciting experiences um, uh, that have shaped him as a, as a true leader of um, um, analytics and uh, data and leader of um, um, analytics and uh, data. And Ben is um, a, a EMEA uh, research leader at ISS Market Intelligence. And uh, if you are feeling that um, um, uh, a little bit of a deja vu, uh, don't worry because uh, Ben, two months ago when they were just starting um, uh, this uh, particular um, analysis and research, which is on the exciting and hot topic in the UK and really globally, which is model, um, uh, model portfolio sales. So welcome Mark and Ben. Thank you start with you can i can you tell us um uh, about what has happened since we last uh, uh, talked about the 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 model portfolio uh, business in the uk and uh, and what you guys have been up to because you have been up to much and i know you have some very very exciting news to share with us exciting news to share with us yeah so so since we were last on this podcast we have learned a lot and and honestly, the first big learning, and, and my colleague Mark will speak to it more, is that high quality data around model portfolios is actually quite lacking. Which is portfolios is actually quite lacking. Which is actually quite surprising because now we've we've also spent the time and, and we've sized some of the market. Uh, and in 2022, we've collected over 48 billion in gross sales going into model portfolios. So what I've been saying is this this is an emerging trend. We're not at the beginning. We're in the middle of it. It's already big. There's a question of just how big it could be. But surprisingly, there's not a lot of good data on it. And this is really exactly why, why Mark and I have spent our efforts sort of studying this topic. And now we're in a position to actually put out a report on it, which is the news. Um, one other thing I'd add is it's, it's funny, gosh, and I'm, I'm sure you've realized this over the years is whenever we're looking at the, the wealth management business, particularly the advised wealth management business, I know myself, I'm, I'm always brought back to the fact that it's it's about relationships and part of the about relationships and part of the, the learning process and, and part of what we've seen in the data 
is how important those relationships are in the model portfolio business. Because you actually see chains of events, you know, you see advisor firms adopting models, which feeds through to certain model providers, DFMs benefiting, which, which feeds network picture, which all makes sense if you realize model portfolios, they sit at the nexus of product and distribution. So it's about relationships, and this is exactly what we've mapped out in this report. And this, this is why we think this, this report is going to be such a revelation to the industry. I've done really a drum roll here. Um, I had an early preview of the of the draft of the report and the kind of the the the, the wealth of data and actionable um, um, uh, ideas in the report is is quite astounding. Um, uh, I'd say that the report is is quite astounding. Um, uh, I'd say that uh, we have to pick both of your brains uh, uh, out uh, for for uh, to expand this kind of capability around the world. Definitely very, very interesting. Ben, before we we uh, um, uh, kind of turn to Mark to tell us more about and the data magic and analytical magic can you tell us a little bit about um uh, you know what is included in the in the report that is going to be again it's uh, it's not launched yet uh, we're getting a real our, our listeners are getting a, a real preview of the report yeah certainly yeah certainly so the the report split out into five sections and each section tries to capture a different aspect of what's happening in the model portfolio space so we start with a section we call the pulse, section one. The idea here is, is we want to understand both, both how quickly, we want to understand both, both how quickly model portfolio sales are growing or if they're in fact retrenching, but not just the, the, the kind of volume of sales here, but how widely spread is it? How many, how many of these actors are benefiting? Again, I think what we're going to see is, is when, these figures on how many are benefiting move in the same direction. And again, if, if there's no growth going the opposite way, but again, it's trying to understand how sales at the model portfolio level really feeds through the system. How, how many players are benefiting? What is the opportunity here? How wide is it? Uh, we move on from that into section two detail to our information set. So what we're talking about in here is we look at what type of firms uh, in the financial advisor channel are selling model portfolios we're looking at model portfolio sales against the wider financial advisor channel. How much of the channel are they accounting for? We're also looking at some of the behavioral aspect in creating model portfolio product shelves. You know, how many model portfolio providers are each financial advisor firm using? And then in addition to having rankings throughout this section, we also tug at some of the details of the funds in terms of, you know, our equity funds. By So we're looking at asset class you know, our equity funds. By a so we're looking at asset class of funds. We're looking at domicile. Again, we're trying to tease out the big picture. Sections three and four, and then dive into the passive and active opportunity. You know, which passive and active fund managers are winning? Is it ESG or not ESG? Fund managers are winning. Is it ESG or not ESG? You know, which funds are winning? And which firms, again, going back to this sort of ecosystem, what's driving what, you know, which financial advisor firms, which model providers are driving active and passive sales. And then finally, we section five is regional perspective. So all the, the mapping, all the insight of sort of given glimpses of, glimpses of so far, we actually have the regional level too. And, and we've actually seen a, a fair amount of diversity in what's happening in the regions. And again, it's because it's all part of different value chain. It's because it's all part of different value chains that are now connected from the investor to the financial advisor they choose down to how that model feeds into the fund managers they're ultimately working with. Yeah, that's really kind of fascinating and really, Ben, what you've just described is the very wide range uh, of types of competitors and players because clearly platforms um, uh, feature throughout and asset managers and the fu individual funds and distributors and advisors. And then that kind of regional aspect is a real, like I found that to be incredible. Uh, I know that uh, this report clearly is not a single salvo, but rather 
and um, uh, at the beginning of uh, what we hope to be a long journey along with our clients to really understand how the model portfolio um, uh, uh, model portfolios are changing the, the are changing the, the asset management business. So um, that's really great. Now, um, uh, none of this <laughs> would be really possible without the the incredible uh, magic of, or as I was just chatting with Mark, I would call it rocket science of what he did. He did to really tease out this level of incredible insight and detail um, out of data that is hardly so. I think. Uh, Mark Ben mentioned that you know it's 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 kind of interesting that with the um, great importance that model portfolio on business in the UK still data is hard to or good data is hard to come by. So tell us a little bit more about your analytical journey with the data that we have, and I know we have a plethora of data, but it's still uh, it. As I talked to you, it seemed like it it was a journey. It was not something that you just. It seemed like it it was a journey. It was not something that you just kind of uh, you know uh, apply your your magic touch and overnight uh, this data would come through. Tell us a little bit more about that, Mark. Well, no, indeed, just as though there's a uh, a Shakespearean cast of players in this particular business. Um, there's a uh, a Shakespearean cast of players in this particular business. Um, there's also different flavors of data. And the point is you have to be very careful to understand exactly what it is you're trying to analyze. And I think the first thing you have to understand is that, you know, what exactly is the product we're talking about? Portfolio service, that's also MPS. Bespoke portfolio, BPS, DFMs, et cetera, et cetera. Is it on or off platform? So the first thing we had to do was just tease out a data set that was relevant that we could rely upon and that's where we took had to well basically had to be off the shelf for clients that are distributed on platform through financial advisors be they appointed reps or or directly authorized so it's, it, it, you have to you have to get one data set as i say that you can quantify and you can rely on you've got a full population so basically what we are not doing is the bespoke private mission. so basically what we are not doing is the bespoke private wealth models, et cetera, by wealth managers or DFMs. Because you see, this is usually off platform and it's directly with the fund manager. So, and why is that? Well, the data just simply isn't available. We keep getting asked, can you do this, that, and the other? But the point is that, but the point is that it's not available in a granular enough format. And the real interesting detail, well, that's jealously guarded by the providers themselves. So the most you can ever do is roughly work out how big the business is, but not really what's going on. It's it's a mountain, but you can't necessarily climb it. So that's what we're defining. Then how did we do it? Well, and what are we measuring? Well, that's the other trick you see. We're looking only at gross sales. That's including switches and so on, into funds. Therefore, we're not looking at stocks and shares or any other investment vehicles that people might have in their models. Again, it's, it's you have to have a population. You have to have a population you can rely on, and I, you know, the vast majority is funds. But you see, we often get asked, "Why not assets? Why don't you look at that?" Uh, well, you see, only gross sales capture current behaviour, and the point is that assets can be misleading. Um, they can because they get aggregate together, hold leading. Um, they can because they get aggregate together, hold mixture of clients, strategies, and of course you've got legacy business. And if you want to tease out the truly significant behavioural trends, you have to remove all this investment noise, basically. And this is this is where it gets more interesting as well, because it's not just opposed to doing this they, this way and that, but we're also interested in knowing, you know, how many DFMs. An IFA will use, a fund man uh, and financial advisor will use. And this is where assets also muddy the water, you see, because a DFM, well, an IFA might work with one or two DFM, but of course, a successful IFM, IFA, he's, he's, he's built up history. He's dealt with people over the years, different platforms. He's collected, inherited many clients, and they'll have their DFMs. And as a result, these assets stick around. I mean, let's be honest, if it's a pension, it could be at least 30, 40 years. So successful IFA carries an awful lot of quite valid baggage. 
Um, now, where else did it lead us then? Well, yeah, you, you see, how could we do all this? So that's, that's what we've defined. But then you have to remember that we've got financial clarity. And in the UK, financial clarity is basically the premier product for investment intelligence. So we have the most comprehensive, the most granular transactional data. And obviously, this is a wealth for us. And so what we looked at was basically all of this from the 13 most significant retail platforms. And in that, we've been able to identify any transaction linked to a, I think roughly over 90% of our analysis has been driven by flags or other indicators that are buried in the data. And this is the rocket science bit, of course, Goshka, is that at first sight, it's not obvious, but you can link one thing to another, to another, you find a pattern, you read it back. It's an adventure. But it must be said that, but it must be said that, although we've been able to do this with most of the platforms, there are still a few platforms out there that, and interesting names as well, that provide absolutely zero intelligence either to us or to the fund managers themselves. And, and you wonder, in the light of consumer duty, which is of course the big wonder, in the light of consumer duty, which is of course the big thing going on in the UK now. You know, how can this persist? You know, they can't stand between the fund manager and the end client any longer, especially now that it's a regulatory requirement. It'll be interesting to see how that space develops. But then what did, what did we actually learn from this? Um, before I pass back to Ben, but let's be honest. Um, well, you've got a flag. Okay, that's interesting. But one of the things we did was, if we didn't have the flag or the data, could we reverse engineer where we knew what a model was. Could we reverse engineer it back into the data? So of course, again, this is a, we have an arm and we've been collecting um, the, the, the composition of these various models over time and the reallocations and, and trying to track it all. And a couple of interesting things came from this. One of them is that when I started out, there's what was about, let's say there's about 4,000 funds in the UK, about 400 are regularly used videos. So there's a lot of duplication out there another story for another podcast. But when I started out, I thought that maybe um, they're all going to choose the same funds. And it's going to be very difficult to tease out one model from another, one DFM from another. And yeah, okay, whilst 60% maybe of a model may be the same fund, and Ben will elucidate on this later, they're not all the same. And they all seem to want to be a, a different enough around the edges for you to be able to identify. So again, if we don't have the flags, or well, we don't have some intelligence buried in the data, we were able to make some fairly decent calls. Also, an observation of the lot, it's the behavior of the DFMs themselves, or shall we call them the model providers? You know, because we've been able to look at the frequency of the allocations, it's surprising what the variation is. On the one hand, you've got some that haven't actually reallocated their portfolio for over a year, um, then allocated their portfolio for over a year, um, then others, and to be fair, this is probably the majority, but not the vast majority, it's just the majority and it's the big names, roughly quarterly, as you'd expect. Obviously, last year was a rather tumultuous year, so there's been a few more, but let's just say at least, you know, four, five, six times a year, five, six times a year. But then there are some out there that reallocate monthly, even intramonthly. You can't help wondering, you know, um, I thought investment was always supposed to be for at least a medium term. And also, I wonder how that will affect the uh, transactional fee analysis. Again, that's another point. Finally, what was the result? So where we got to was we took these 13 platforms, all the data sets I've said, we've looked at 2022, and we have identified gross sales of around about 119 billion. I'd like to round it up to 120, but it is 119. And using this methodology, the one I've just laid out, methodology, the one I've just laid out, we've been able to identify model-related behavior that covers about you know, two-thirds of this sample, which is, you know, I'd like to push it higher, but two-thirds is a pretty solid, over two-thirds, a pretty solid um, proxy for the whole market. And what have we learned? Well, proxy for the whole market. And what have we learned? Well, that is obviously over to Ben. Well, thank you, Mark. And uh, there are, uh, you know, I, I love uh, that you called it uh, a mountain to climb. It seems to me like a range to climb. And again, I want to sense it easy 
it's anything but um, and uh, kind of coming from that uh, data um, uh, deep data background here um, uh, you know uh, throughout my career in the business uh, I, I can just uh, appreciate um, the 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 nuance that's needed like how, how Mark said reverse engineer it's it's uh, it's rock and science level reverse engineering of data. So um, and two thirds, I think two thirds is a very uh, very meaningful and and very uh, respectable uh, uh, result for the let's say respectable uh, uh, result for the let's say MPS uh, at large in terms of the control of the of the growth flow. So. Uh, ben, uh, off to you, you for your insights and your big aha moments with this uh, with this new data set. Yeah, so so I'll provide our our listener support. So I mean, the the first thing is we've talked about the size of model portfolio flows. I mentioned at the beginning, forty eight billion. What the what people need to realize though is is one you can measure how big you know, the flows are today as part of the total universe. So we said the total universe, total universe, you know, we had 119 billion on platform financial advisor sales, 48 billion of these are model. But one, as Mark said, one finding was of the firms we have in the financial advisor channel, two thirds of them are using at least one model. And those at least one model. And those firms though, account for 105 billion of the sales. So the the reach of model portfolios is vast. Model portfolios have touched almost every part of the financial advisor channel. Almost everywhere you see meaningful sales, everywhere you see meaningful sales, someone has at least tried out a model. And this is big because that means the trajectory is high the potential of model portfolios is really high. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a lot that still has to happen for them to be very widely adopted and to grow into the space they have access to as a product solution. But there's a lot of space for them to grow into and they've started to set roots in those space. Because second, what you see is model portfolio sales. Again, we looked at the financial advisor space. We split it out into different firm types. It's all in the portfolio sales and all the firm types. Okay, again, another perspective that the reach is wide. And sort of another thing I want to pick up because I started the conversation about relationships. Mark talked about how much we have in our data, how we can see things flow all the way through. I think last I checked when we flow all the way through, I think last I checked when we looked at financial advisors and model providers, we mapped out over 9,000 relationships. And what we can do, though, bigger than that, is to map out how important some of those relationships are and what defines those are and what defines those relationships, what defines the biggest ones. Where do you see them? Is there anything unique about them? So that's what pops out of our data set. And I mean, that's where we've already pulled out some great insights, but we're going to be able to pull it a lot more because we have this rich relationship set. And now we have to see what's special and what makes certain pieces of it. FA to model provider side. On, on the fun side, some of the interesting things are, well, one is the, the concentration you see. Passive funds, I mean, maybe not a big shocker, but you see it. The passive managers benefiting from model portfolios is a very small set. And those flows are, high, and those flows are highly concentrated. You know, the top 10 managers make up almost all the flows. Where it's with active, you see a lot of diversity. And the top 10 make up less than two-fifths of the total flows. And you have way more managers in that space. And that kind of gets to Mark's comment and what we saw with fund Mark's comment and what we saw with fund managers and funds. You see a lot of the common names. I mean, I don't think anyone will be surprised that, that Vanguard and BlackRock, when we moved to our regional data, we're number one in all the regions. One of those two was number one in all the regions from fund manager perspective. I don't think that's gonna shock people or work with almost every model provider. But there is still a fair bit of differentiation in the models and with a lot of them, it is the active managers you're using. It could be more specialized mandates. You're starting to see it more and more in ESG. Again, interesting thing. We're looking for new funds we didn't see in the past. 
sales measure because as Mark says, we're trying to avoid too much confusion from the legacy picture. But if we look at the top five new funds we've identified in the model space that are having sales this six months, didn't have it in the previous six months, there's an element of ESG to all of them. Um, and I think if we're talking opportunity and opportunity and, and what's in the report is there's a lot of room for ESG to still grow, to still have a bigger influence. Again, though, how how tied will that be to what the FCA does with their SDR uh, regulations around ESG? But that was kind of another finding. And then the last thing, which I've already touched, pops out of the regional section. Well, again, it's it's at the model provider level where you see a lot of the diversity. And some of that carries through to the fund managers. But again, we see fund managers who clearly have this very broad appeal. We see fewer model providers, fewer model providers with a broad appeal. And again, it makes sense. I, I think for many model providers, did they have large sales forces coming into this? Did they see them as truly UK uh, you know, sales agencies? How many of these model providers of their traditionally DFMs have the sales net model providers of their traditionally DFMs have the sales networks that the largest fund managers are going to have? But now with the model portfolios, now they're on the front lines of distribution. Um, so I think there's still a lot more room for for product shelves of financial advisor firms to grow for those product shelves and one we're tracking. And this is tied to the relationships is how are those product shelves being crafted? I mean, gosh, you have such a wealth of experience. You know that if the product shelf changes, almost everything can change. Like, like how the product shelf is being built, how it's being filtered is pretty central to the wealth, central to the wealth management landscape. In the model portfolio shelves, I don't think they've been fully optimized. I don't think they've been fully articulated. So how that articulation happens I think is going to speak a lot to who wins and who loses in the shift to model portfolios. To model portfolios. Thank you, Ben. And you know what? Building on that, uh, a really amazing point about the shelf construction and um, what is the role of gatekeeping, etc. I think that one other important thought um, that that you have um, at um, going forward if the MPS is the dominant way of of generating flows in the in the fund industry in the UK um, what are the the, the key con strategic considerations around who owns the economics of the business is there a redistribution of the revenue stream uh, you know now with the with that potentially additional layer or of model portfolio providers um, uh, and so on. So I, I I know Ben that we're pretty. You and I are pretty passionate about the topic of the economics of the business. What what are your thoughts on that? Mix of the business. What what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head. And and I'll go back to saying model portfolios. It's at that nexus of product and distribution. It's there's an element of control there. Especially again, it depends how concentrated. The business, created, the business becomes at the model provider level. I think how much pricing power is going to be gained. I mean, in theory, and, and, and back to our first podcast, I sort of posited it. These model providers, if they grow large, they're going to start looking like institutional managers. Some of them probably already do. And as we've seen, those run, there's, a, there's a big chance that pricing power moves to the model provider, especially on the fund side. Again, it's going to be down to concentration. How many are ultimately kind of winning? Is there consolidation in the business? Two, though, I think what we have to understand is, is the model provider, again, if we think about it at the nexus, is the model provider, again, if we think about it at the nexus, we need to think about how many adjacent revenue streams is it attached to? Because now it's attached to the advice fee uh, because it's part of this solution. Now it's attached to the fund management fee, both the, the fund administration fee, both the, the fund administration fee, and then the security selection fee sort of in that fund as well, or the investment management fee. I mean, it's now adjacent to these revenues. And the question people need to ask is what incentives, or the last revenue I should say, the platform, 
much of this business sits on platforms there that there's probably a maximum fee clients can be charged. You know, it's probably a range depending on the wealth of the client. But if we assume clients, investors, there's essentially a maximum fee that could come out of the returns to sort of feed the ecosystem. Well, now we see the, the models at the, at the center of the trough, of the trough. And now we have to understand, okay, all the actors not at the center of this trough, and this could be one of the, the controlling parts of basically where the feed goes to, what's their incentive? And we've, what's their incentive to what I call value chain creep, to move up a value chain creep, to move up or down the value chain, to, to make sure of that total investor fee, they're getting their fair share. And again, if models take what some people see as more than their fair share, then you're going to want to be in that space. And I, I think just, just to close this off, what we've already seen is funders have got into the space, platforms have gotten into the space, large financial advisor firms have built their own models. And of course you do have the traditional players, the DFMs, but who else is gonna join? I mean, again, it sits in the middle and so many other of these adjacent revenues are tied in, you know, who's gonna come for their relationships? Because people can old, own the whole value chain, they can own parts of it. And again, where's the pricing power? What's the opportunity? What is each person's incentive or each actor's incentive? Yes, and I think that that Ben gives us a very good sense of what we think um, Mark the last uh, uh, kind of segment to tell us about um, uh, you know no one is closer to this data um, um, uh, and this an analysis Mark than you what where do you want to take it from here and uh, what are some of the questions that have left and uh, what are some of the questions that have left you um, you know still wanting for more answers um, in terms of the future of this research well we've already had a bit of a well we've learned from talking to a few people who present this to that obviously people have other questions from talking to a few people who present this to that obviously people have other questions so i think what we've learned is that right we've got the data we've been able to tease out all the key data points we've recognized what we can and what we can't do um but obviously we've taken it from one view we're, we're you know you go down you're trying to find out who who's running the market names are but maybe that's not always the way to look at it Maybe you should say, well, does it matter who? Maybe it's what strategies are they actually applying? And so one classic piece of information that, that, that just wasn't there, and now I'm realizing we've got it in the data and I'm, going to, I'm, I'm eager to get around to actually pulling it out. Forgetting the model, do, do, do people generally choose one fund with another? Are there bunches of funds that go together? Um, there's a lot of overlap out there. You know, There's lots of very similar equity funds and whatever. But are there certain pairings, shall we call them, although it'd be more than two? And that would be fascinating because that to a fund manager, for example, that they say, well, look, maybe it does not matter as to which DFM I should be dealing with, et cetera, or which wealth manager. Maybe it's a question of how do I compare against my peers? How, how does my story work? You know, do people buy my story? Do they put us alongside this? Who are my real competitors? And again, because um, the whole idea is you're supposed to understand at a much more granular level who is buying. Well, by definition, you know why they're buying in a sense. And that, so that's the next bit. And the great thing is that we've got the data. We just didn't particularly focus our initial research on that because everyone wants to know who. And I think the thing you realize when you're doing this sort of research, the thing you realize when you're doing this sort of research is that the question, how can I put this? Um, people often, shall I say, um, they answer their own questions. They assume the way to get to the answer they want is X, when actually what they should be doing is answering, asking a totally different question, because what they really need to know is why. But I think we see a totally different question, because what they really need to know is why. But I think we see that in life in general. So let's just say that um, what we have will develop over time, but it's now trying to sort of get other people's views and, and other people's takes on it and and say, right, we can we can spin that data this way or that. But basically we've got Yes, Mark, and uh, this is so so well said, and and uh, you're right. It's not just about who, but the why. And uh, I you know as as the opening salvo of this um of this uh, analysis and this research 
this is uh you know having having doubt um it's it's very compelling and i i'm really looking forward to uh seeing where this analysis and where where this data takes us um it takes us in the future and mark to underscore your point is that sometimes um there is a lot of intuition or you know oh makes sense there is a lot of intuition or you know Oh, makes sense. Okay, these are the big people. This is who I'm competing against. But to actually have a data based proof positive of these things is also a very, very powerful thing because sometimes intuition is great and sometimes it fails us. So I, I find is great and sometimes it fails us. So I, I find that that uh, you have really done with this with this analysis, this research, you have um, both uncovered some, uh, confirmed some intuitions that we have had about this marketplace, but also truly landed on some very unique um, ideas that uh, ban a lot of interpretation for. So guys, thank you. I could be doing this for hours, it's obvious. Um, we are data fanatics and passionate uh, uh, observers of the business, but alas, I must uh, uh, finish now or my mic is going to be pulled away from me. Mark, Ben, thank you very much. We look forward to hearing more and more about this um, really intriguing data set, uh, the analytics and the, the research um, key takeaways. Um, I will uh, um, uh, thank our listeners at this time. It's a wrap for us, uh, but did want to mention uh, to everyone that we are working on several um, topics for um, uh, upcoming podcasts. Um, we are recording this in the week of the International Women's Day, so we will have um, a very interesting uh, uh, podcast about women in wealth management in the next uh, month and a half coming your way. Any more exciting things and the uh, topic uh, alternatives and more reflections about life insurance business. So stay tuned. Um, please remember to subscribe to um, my talk podcast on your platform of choice. And as always, um, I encourage all of you, our listeners, to ping us with your ideas, to ping us with your ideas and let us know what it is that we at ISS Market Intelligence can, can um, uh, illuminate um, on and uh, what type of guests you would like to um, uh, see us bring uh, to this podcast. Again, thank you very much. And I